welcome to episode two of Kintsugi Talks. Again, my name is Soroya Brown, and for those that have sent me so much love and support for starting this podcast and for the first episode, which was pretty much an introduction to what you can expect, thank you so, so, so much. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Now, for today's episode, if you see by the title, I'm going to talk about my diagnosis journey. Everything that has led up to the point of the diagnosis of my mental illnesses. Now, this story is quite long, so these episodes will be in parts. So the second episode of this podcast will be part one of my diagnosis journey story. Without further ado, let's get started. Now, growing up, There was no real talk about mental health and mental illness. It was either referred to as you're crazy or people who had something um, of some type of mental illness issue, they just weren't safe to be around. I only knew about depression from television as just being really sad, but... I knew from the age of five years old, yes, five, that there was something different about me. I knew from the age of five, I can say that I had quite um, a sense of awareness from that age that I shouldn't have been having thoughts of death and dying. I shouldn't have been fantasizing Oh, what does it feel like to be in a casket? What does it feel like to be dead? Like, I, no five-year-old should be having thoughts like that. And so I knew from that age that there was something not wrong with me, but there was something different about me. My first deaf experience was with my grandmother, at the age of 12, um, she was someone that was just a very, very, very dear person to my heart. Um, she died of brain cancer. And it was a death that, till this day, it um, affects my family very, very much. And her death, uh, caused kind of the the starting point of where my depression and anxiety grew along with just a lot of family dysfunction and this is where a lot of my suicidal ideation and even going into self-harm that is where um a lot of that stuff started for me at the age of 12. I was also bullied in the sixth grade, Um, and it was not a fun experience. I know there's millions of people in the world that have been bullied, and we can all agree that bullying is something that we don't wish on anybody. Um, My type of bullying that I experienced, it was more so verbal, wasn't physical, Um, I think there was a few instances where it was physical, like a push or a shove here, but it was more so um, verbal and emotional bullying. And um, that is what led me to kind of my first big acts of trying to take my own life, which was drinking bleach. You heard me correctly. I said I started drinking bleach, like Clorox, 99.99% bleach alcohol used to clean up pee spots on hardwood floor, stuff like that. And I did that for, I want to say it lasted for like, a few weeks so probably like two months or something like that and 
just to preface this by saying no one in my family knew that I was even dealing with stuff like this. Because when you grew up in the type of household that I lived in, especially in a household where you had to grow up quickly, a lot of responsibility was put on you. And if you did tell them something like that, they would try to flip it on you to make it seem like you did something bad when really there was something wrong with you. And you just told them because you wanted support from people that were supposed to give it to you that way in the first place. No. So I hid it and I hid it very well until this day. Well, up until some of them come across this podcast and hear this story, this is how they're going to find out. So I snuck around and I drank the bleach until one day I started coughing up blood. And in my head, well, the average person would think, oh my God, something is wrong. In my head, I was thinking, yes, it's working. I think I'm finally going to die today. So I go to my mom and I was literally trying to hide the excitement in my voice because I literally, I wanted to die. And so I go to my mom and I try to sound as worried as possible. And I'm like, mom, I just, I coughed up blood. I don't know what's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. And so she immediately calls 911. The ambulance gets there. And I think like five minutes, which is probably one of the quickest times the ambulance has gotten to my house in the hood, in the Bronx. If you know, you know. So we go to the hospital and I kept coughing up blood the whole way. And then next thing I know, I wake up to like needles and stuff in my arm. And I had this huge bandage on my stomach. And I wake up like trying to open my eyes because all I see is just like this white light. So I'm thinking that I was like, oh, this is heaven? Like, did I finally, did I, like, succeed? Like, did I, did I succeed in, like, taking my own life? But then when I hear, like, my mother's voice and I hear voices of doctors, I'm like, oh, I failed. And now I know people listening to this will probably be like, wow, like, why would you think like that? And I'm like, because the only goal I had at that time was I didn't want to be here anymore. That was the goal. And anyone who was who was in my shoes, like if they're currently in that state of mind or have fought for a very long time to not be in that state of mind anymore, can relate. So the doctor sees that I like woke up and says that Miss Brown, you're very lucky to be alive. And then my mother's like, well, what happened? Like, what like, what did you find inside of her stomach? Now, you would think, you would think that the doctors would have found the bleach in my stomach because the bleach is like, it's, it's a pure chemical. You would think something like that is very easy to find in the system. But no. They said that some type of virus that they've never seen before had started to destroy the lining of my stomach. And the acid that is inside my stomach started to leak out into the places where my other organs are and it was very close to rupturing my intestine. And that is what was causing me to cough up blood because it had messed up some of like the blood vessels and stuff that is there. And they said, if I hadn't gotten there sooner, my intestines would have exploded and I would have been dying from the inside out. And then my mom was happy. She was crying. She was like praising God and all this stuff. And in my head, I'm just like, I'm in the outside, I'm smiling. But on the inside, I'm like, how could I mess this up and trying to take my life? This was like the perfect way I could have done this. Like, how could I have messed this up? Now, 
this at this point uh anorexia and bulimia behavior is starting to increase and were added on to my life as well and i'll do a quick little story of how that even started so uh, as a child you have a pediatrician as a doctor um, pediatrician is the doctor that is like especially for children up until a certain age and as a child I was considered to be overweight obese according to the BMI system which is the body mass index it is a system that is used to um, say pretty much which weight you should be at according to your age and your height and also fun fact about the BMI system which I actually learned from the nutritionist that I have now that system was made by a philosopher philosopher to study the average size of a man now I think it is so funny that something that was used to just find out the average size of a man created by a philosopher is now used to judge and critique what weight men and women should be based on their age and their height. Very interesting. In case you didn't know, now you know. But back to the story. So it was another regular visit with me and my mom we went to my pediatrician i technically had two different pediatricians i had one that was a female and one that was a male the male was the one that was kind of like the head doctor of the office because it was like his practice more so and in this visit he said in front of my mother and me that your weight is becoming a problem now, I was like, I had to have been like preteen, teenager age when this happened. I don't remember my exact age, but I was, I was young. I was a child. So he said, your weight is starting to become a problem. What I suggest you do, this is a doctor saying this. Remember, doctor, license, everything, said that you should wait until your stomach stops growling and then you can eat. You heard that right. A licensed professional doctor who, by the way, for those who are asking, he still practices till this day, told me a child in front of my mother, and also my mother agreed, by the way, to this, that I should wait until my stomach stops growling for me to eat because that'll help me to lose weight. This doctor essentially said in the most short-term way as possible for me to starve myself. I just want, take that in, take that in. Imagine you as a child getting told that by a medical professional. Now imagine you being told that by a medical professional in front of your mother who already would daily judge and criticize you because of your weight. Wouldn't do it in a loving and supportive way by like encouraging you to just do like substitutes of different foods, but no, would punish you for wanting seconds of food would punish you for asking for a second cup of juice, would try to sneak around diet pills, diet supplements, sprinkle it into your food and thought that she wouldn't get caught. But she did because I did find out that she was sprinkling stuff into my food. But I couldn't say anything because she's my mother. Mother is always right. And I couldn't say anything in that moment to the doctor because he's a doctor. He's a professional. He knows what he's doing, right? Now we're going to fast forward a bit into high school. High school is where self-harm for me became the worst. 
um, more so with mutilation. For those that don't know what mutilation is, um, it's pretty much you're literally giving yourself cuts and bruises. Um, along with suicidal actions when I found out that I was adopted. Now, I will not share that story in this episode. That'll be for a future episode of how I found out I was adopted and how that affected me greatly, even till this day. And all of this occurred in my life up until I was in high school. And now for those that remember a detail that I shared was that I did the prayer salvation when I was about like 11, 12 years old and I accepted God into my life then. Now, this is the event that led me to becoming more serious with God, developing my own relationship with God so I was home one day Um, I was actually by myself because my mother had a doctor's appointment my sister was out with friends as usual Um, my brothers were with their families so I was home alone I was at the age where I was old enough to be home alone And it had became a just almost daily routine at this point for me to get up, brush my teeth, wash my face, head to the kitchen, grab a knife and start going at my arm, going at whatever part of my body I chose to, to, that I just, I chose for that day. And so I was in the kitchen and now to kind of paint a picture Um, architecturally of what my kitchen looked like in my apartment, the apartment that I grew up in. So there was a, like a doorway to the kitchen, but there wasn't like an actual door that like swung open. It was just like a doorway. And then kind of at the top where there's like a, the space that connects to the ceiling, you know, um, there's that part of the door and I'm, I am pointing that out for a reason. So inside the kitchen, we had like the ceiling fan, um, a very old creaky ceiling fan. Um, but then on the opposite side of the entranceway to the kitchen on the wall, my mother had this like woven picture of the last supper. If there is anyone that can relate growing up in an ethnic household, that had a picture of the Last Supper, please let me know. Because I feel like like if you were Black, Latina, Asian, and your parents were Christian, there was a picture of the Last Supper somewhere in your house. But anyway, so I got my knife and I was about to do what to do. I don't like how I said that so nonchalantly, but... This is just me being very real and honest. So yeah, I was about to do what to do with the knife. And I look up and I am just in total awe, total shock, flabbergasted, if you will. I see that there is a ray, a literal ray of light shining from the ceiling fan. It is going through the top of the wall that is above the entrance of the doorway. And it's shining through the wall. And the light is directly hitting Jesus' face. Directly shining on Jesus' face with like glitter and everything. Now, I see that I had the knife in my hand. I dropped it to the floor and following that I dropped to my knees and I just started crying immediately. I am sobbing, ruddy nose, snot, everything. And I said, oh my God, 
God is real. Like, God, you've been watching me all this time, doing all this stuff to myself. Like, I don't know how or why you would show yourself to me like this when I was about to do what I was about to do. And I'm just like going on and on. I'm just like crying and stuff like that. And then this is a moment that I will never forget. I literally felt, felt hands around me. Now, again, I was home alone, home alone. I did not hear no door open. I would have heard the door open because where the kitchen was in my house, it was like down the hallway from the front door. No one was home. It was just me. I literally felt hands and arms come around me and give me the most warm embrace of a hug. And that's when I started shaking. Because it's like, I felt cold, but then the hug was just so warm. And it was like giving me warmth that I haven't felt like ever. I've never felt a warmness like that. And so then I hear a voice clear as day. And it sounded so, so sweet, yet stern and strong, but calm at the same time and the voice said every time you went to hurt your arm it was my arm instead that was being hurt when you laid in that hospital I was the one that protected your insides for getting damaged every time You cried. I collected your tears. You may not have felt me, and you may not have seen me, but I was there the whole time. And my love for you never changed in that whole time. It has stayed the same, and it has only grown from then, and it will continue to grow. And I was just... At this point, I was just in disbelief. I was just in disbelief because I'm like, this is Jesus talking to me. Like, Jesus is really talking to me. And I never thought I would have an experience like this, like just kind of like a face-to-face experience with Jesus. I didn't see his face. I just heard his voice and he was hugging me. So I said, Jesus, like, I don't know what you want me to do because I feel like the only mess up. I feel like the only screw up right now just like what do you want me to do because you see what I'm dealing with you see what I have been dealing with like I don't know what to do and so he says simple as day he says just follow me just love me just listen to me and everything will be okay and I just like shook my head up and down and I was like okay I will I will do that. Now, I am sorry to end it here, but that'll be the end of the episode for today. Now, again, this is just part one. Part two, I will go to further along of where I actually get my first diagnosis of depression and how um, during that time I was dealing with a lot of stuff in church that affected my mental health and illness, me getting hospitalized for that when I started taking medication and so on and so forth. But for those that sat through this whole episode, this whole um, thing of me telling my story, I thank you and I appreciate you for listening. If you would do me the favor of leaving a rating, leaving a comment, leaving a review, sharing this with your friends, family, people who would love and appreciate something like this. Again, it will be greatly appreciated. I love you guys so, 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 so much. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Kintsugi Talks. Until then, God bless.